Well, good morning, Rhythm Church, and happy Resurrection Sunday. So glad that you guys are all here today. My name is Corey Atkinson. I have the joy of serving as the lead pastor here at Rhythm. Um, and if you have a Bible, go ahead and open that up to Mark chapter 16. If you don't have one, no worries. We will have the verses up here on the screen in just a moment as well. Uh, but today we're going to look at two things in particular. We are going to look at the regrets of Jesus' disciples, and we're going to look at the resurrection of Jesus. See, I would imagine that Jesus' disciples, uh, before they realized the resurrection, would have done just about anything to rewind the story and rewrite their part in it. Because as we will see, the disciples don't shine too bright in their big moment. Now, with that said, I would imagine that the same thing is true of all of us. We've had some moments, big or small, that we really wish we could have a rewind and a rewrite on. Um, there's one particular story that came to my mind this week as I thought about it. Um, a handful of years, Kara and I uh, were living in Georgia at the time, and we went to lunch with a few friends from the church, and it was one of those lunches that we didn't have a lot to do that day, so it went on a lot longer than normal. And so we were probably at this place for two hours at least, maybe a little bit more. And so when we left, it was pushing 2.30, maybe even to 3 o'clock. And I didn't really think much about it at the time. On the way home, this route, I, I drive it, you know, three times a week, something like that. So it was fairly familiar. And so I was kind of on autopilot. And so me and Kara take off. We're talking like normal. And I take a right at the stoplight. And I'm going forward. And about 10 seconds later, I, I sort of snap back into focus because I see what looks like a crossing guard coming into the middle of the street. Now, again, I usually come home from lunch or head back to the church from lunch at like 1 o'clock. So in this short period of time, I am not aware enough to put all of the pieces together that, wait a second, we're passing a school. It is later than normal. And there is a crossing guard that is coming into the road. And in addition to that, crossing guards kind of have their own language. You know, they use their little sticks and stuff. But if you're not paying attention, you're not really going to get it. So as I started to get closer, she started doing that, waving her stuff. And I couldn't tell whether she was telling me to stop or whether she was saying, why are you being weird? Just keep driving. And so I had this moment where I started to press on the brakes and slow down, but I was like, no, no, I think it's the other. And so I kind of panicked, right? And so I put my foot down a little bit and I kind of sped up right through and I, I was just like, hey, that was weird, but I'm just going to drive on and hope for the best. Well, the best did not happen because there was a police officer that was about 10 yards beyond that. I didn't see that at the time. That could have maybe helped uh, change my decision a little bit. He's about 10 yards ahead, and as soon as I pass him, he whips around and comes up right behind me, and um, I tried to explain to him all the particulars of the situation. You know, hey, it's later than normal. I wasn't thinking, and uh, unfortunately, he didn't really care, and so I ended up getting a ticket that day. Now, I want you guys to guess how much you think that ticket was, okay? I have a few options up here. Was that ticket... $600. Raise your hand if you think it was six. A couple of you playing it safe. Uh, how many of you think it was $650? Okay, a little bit more. How many think it was $700? It's kind of even there. Well, it's a trick question. It was over $900. I didn't even know tickets could go that high. In fact, a couple years later, when I was living in Texas, I got another ticket in a little small town in Texas. And uh, because it was a little small town, on the back of it, it sort of had, you know, a list of things that you might have gotten pulled over for. And it had an estimate of how much that ticket might cost. And I figured out that in Falfurious, Texas, 
I could have gotten pulled over by a police officer going 20 miles per hour over the speed limit in a stolen car, and it would have been less than the ticket that I got in Georgia for accidentally being confused in a school zone. And that was disappointing, you know, because I'm like, hey, if I'm going to get a $900 ticket, I want it to count. Uh, like, I want to have at least have some fun. Like, I should have taken the sushi chef hostage or something and, you know, drove off uh, from the restaurant. But it was definitely one of those moments where I was thinking, man, I really, really wish that I could rewind and rewrite that part of the day because that would have saved me a lot of trouble, would have saved me a lot of money. So again, like I said, I think that we would all like the ability to rewind and rewrite certain parts of our story. And the disciples understood this as we will see today. So Mark chapter 16, let's go ahead and dive in. We're going to start in Mark. Eventually we will uh, jump to Luke briefly and we will end in John. Mark 16 verses 1 through 4. It says, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Siloam brought spices so that they could go and anoint Jesus' body. Very early in the morning on the first day of the week, they went to the tomb at sunrise. They were saying to one another, who will roll the stone away from the entrance to the tomb for us? Looking up, they noticed that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled away. So... Let's get a timeline here. Friday was the crucifixion. We got Good Friday. Saturday was the Sabbath, and the Jewish people rested on the Sabbath. And then Sunday was the resurrection, but they are not aware of this yet. And so they do the right thing. They chill on the Sabbath, and they get up on Sunday morning, and they go to Dennis's favorite tradition. They go to the first ever sunrise service. They're going to head to the tomb. But they're not going there to worship. They are going there to anoint Jesus' body with spices. Now, here's the thing. There's only one reason that you would show up with anointing spices. And that is if you were trying to stop the smell of decomposition. In other words... For these ladies and for most of the disciples, I would imagine, resurrection wasn't on the radar. They were not expecting Jesus to come back. Because if they're going to anoint his body with spices, they assume he is staying right there. That body's not moving. And it's going to go through the same regular processes that any body would go through after death. And so resurrection was not on the radar for them. And you see this in all of the different gospel accounts. There are so many different moments where Jesus' disciples did not connect the dots to what he was doing and what his plans were. One of my favorite is in Matthew's gospel. This is when Jesus is about to ascend back to heaven, and he's giving the disciples what is called the Great Commission, where he's going to tell them, hey, go and make disciples of all nations. And so Jesus gets up on the Mount of Olives. He is teaching, and it literally says the disciples gathered, and it says that some worshiped and some doubted. And my thought is, bro, Jesus is standing in front of you. How can you still be doubting at this point? He is right there. He is talking to you. And they're like, I don't know, man. I'm going to need a little bit more proof than that. And so you see this all throughout the different gospel accounts. That they did not expect resurrection. It was not on the radar. He had alluded to it multiple times. And at this point, he had even appeared to many, at least in uh, what I was talking about in Matthew's gospel. But they were still leery of it because resurrection wasn't on the radar. Which is why Saturday had to have been one of the hardest days in the history of the world. Because the disciples were not hanging out Saturday night with pizza and Mr. Pibb waiting for the resurrection ball to drop to ring in the new creation. 
They were not expecting that at all. And so Saturday night was an extremely difficult night. And really the whole day was. The disciples were probably confused. There are some of them that were probably angry. Maybe they were depressed, disillusioned. And, and whatever they were feeling, the future was a big, scary question mark. Now, this was the case for all of the disciples. But there's one disciple in particular that I think of who probably had the longest Saturday of all. And I think that's why Mark points him out in the next few verses. Let's pick back up in verse 5. It says, When they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side. They were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he told them. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who is crucified. He has risen. He is not here. You see where they put him, but go tell his disciples and who? Peter. Tell his disciples and Peter. He is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there just as he told you. So the ladies go in the tomb. They see an angel. So what other accounts tell us, clarify that. It was not just a dude in some dazzling white clothes. It was an angel. So they go in there and he says, hey, you got the wrong address. Jesus does not live here anymore. But then he says, go tell his disciples and Peter. Now, why single out Peter? Well, let's think about this. Even amongst non-Christians, Peter has a little bit of a reputation. Because if you were to ask a non-Christian, what do you know about Peter? They might go, Peter, Peter, uh, is that the guy that denied Jesus in the end? And it's unfortunate that that is sort of his reputation. But most people have heard that story. And so that is the truth of Peter's situation. You see, the last moment of Peter's interaction with Jesus is quite memorable because it is quite a blunder. Peter botches it in the last moments, in his shining moment. In fact, if you don't know the story, what happens is Jesus has been betrayed. The guards are whisking him away to their little bogus trial. And Peter is covertly following them in the shadows, trying to keep an eye on what's going on. And during this time, Peter is approached three different times by someone essentially saying, wait a second, weren't you with Jesus? Yeah, you were hanging with Jesus. And every single time, Peter's like, geez, I don't know that guy. That guy? No, 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 not me. You, you, got, you got the situation all wrong. Never seen the guy in my life does it three times in a row. Now, what makes it worse is that if you go back a little bit, Peter propped himself up pretty high right before all this happened. Jesus was hanging with the disciples, and Peter essentially was like, hey, Jesus, tonight we don't know what's going to go down, but if all these other guys fall away, I'm your ride or die. I'm going to be with you. These other guys might... Mess it all up, I'm going to stand firm. And Jesus, you know, pops his prideful bubble and he's like, actually, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. And that's exactly what happens. Peter denies Jesus three times and then he hears the sound of a rooster crowing filling his ears. And Luke's gospel actually adds that Jesus turned and his eyes met Peter's. And after that, Peter walks away and he weeps because Jesus was right. All right, when the, when the stuff went down, Peter would rather save his own skin than stand with his Savior. And so he walks away weeping. And this was the last interaction between Jesus and Peter before Jesus is crucified. So you can imagine on Saturday, how Peter is feeling. You can imagine that on Saturday, which by the way, 
It was the Sabbath, and so you couldn't sort of just go and do things and get your mind off of it. You know, let me go try to work to forget about this. No, you had to rest on the Sabbath. So he was stuck there with his own head, with his own thoughts. And I would imagine that on that Saturday, he replayed that time and time and time again in his mind. I would imagine the sound of the rooster crowing echoed inside of his head all day. I imagine that Jesus' sorrowful eyes were seared into his mind. I would imagine that Peter was not having a good Saturday. I would guess it might have been one of the worst Saturdays of Peter's life. Because like the rest of the disciples, resurrection wasn't on the radar for any of them. But for Peter in particular, restoration wasn't on the radar either. They didn't know resurrection was going to happen. Therefore, Peter thought, I blew it. I blew it. I had my chance. Now Jesus is gone. There's no chance to make it right. He didn't realize that restoration could still be a possibility. And so I think the reason that the angel says, tell the disciples and Peter, is because if there was anyone who needed to know There's a second chance ahead. It was Peter. If there's anybody that needed to know that they could still right their wrongs, it was Peter. So the angel says, go tell the disciples, but make sure Peter hears. And so the women go and do just that. Now we're going to jump to Luke where we see the women come back and share this news. Luke chapter 24 Verses 9 through 12. It says, Returning from the tomb, they reported all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them were telling the apostles these things. But these words seemed like nonsense to them, and they did not believe the women. Unfortunately, we still have not learned that lesson, I don't believe. Check out verse 12, though. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. They come and they they say, hey, look, Jesus has risen. And everyone else is rolling their eyes. And Peter is like, say less. He runs to the tomb. Again, I would imagine it's because that's the first time that Peter realized, wait a second, maybe there's an alternate ending to the one that I wrote. Maybe we can still fix this whole thing. And so he jets over there. He actually responds in a very similar way in John's gospel. There's another story in John chapter 21. This is the third time that Jesus appears to his disciples. And John tells us that some of the crew went fishing. And after a full night of catching nothing but Z's, They encounter someone who who gives them a little tip. So they're coming back into shore, and there's a guy on the shore who says, hey, you didn't catch anything. And they're like, yes, thank you for reminding us. And then he gives them a tip, which turns out pretty well. Let's read it in John 21, verses 4 through 7. It says, when daybreak came, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not know it was Jesus. Friends, Jesus called to them, you don't have any fish, do you? No, they answered. Okay, cast the net on the right side of the boat, he told them, and you will find some. So they did, and they were unable to haul it in because of the large number of fish. Disciple, the one Jesus loved, said to Peter, it's the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard it, heard that it was the Lord, he tied his outer clothing around him, for he had taken it off, and he plunged into the sea. So this guy, they don't recognize, gives them a tip. It works really well, and it clicks with John first, because this exact same scenario actually already happened years prior. In Luke's gospel, in Luke 5, we see their first interaction with Jesus, and he says a very similar thing. They had just gotten back from a failed attempt at fishing, 
At this point, they don't know who Jesus is. They hadn't even started following him. And he says, hey, guys, I noticed you caught nothing. Go back out just a little further one more time. And so they're reluctant. They're like, man, we haven't caught anything. Leave us alone. But they finally give in. And sure enough, they catch so many fish that they have to get their friends in the other boat to come and help them get all the fish on the shore. And so that already happened years ago. And so when John sees this happen, it clicks and he goes, wait a second. This looks familiar. That's Jesus. And then the light bulb slowly goes off and the other's there. Peter, secondly, and Peter, without even thinking, he just dives into the water, which was not very practical. And I think John lovingly points that out in the next verse. Verse 8, he says, Since they were not far from land, about 100 yards away, the other disciples came in the boat like normal people, dragging the net full of fish. And once they arrive, the text tells us that Jesus has a fire going and he's got some fish on there. And so what happens is Jesus and the boys whip up some fish tacos and they're chowing down together. And there's probably a mix of feelings at this brunch. You know, there's, there's joy, there's excitement, there's anticipation, but there's also kind of this, this awe and wonder at what exactly is going on. And if you're Peter, I would guess that there is still this gnawing anxiety inside you. Because I would imagine that Peter has interacted with Jesus since he has rose again. Again, this is the third time Jesus is appearing to them. But based on the context, it doesn't seem like Jesus and Peter have had that one-on-one -on -one that Peter is so desiring. They haven't really had a chance to clear the air since Peter denied Jesus and everything else unfolded after that. But finally, he gets his one-on-one -on -one with Jesus. And the text tells us that they stroll down the shoreline. Maybe they make some small talk. Maybe Peter updates Jesus on the comings and goings of the disciples. But eventually, Jesus gets to the pressing point on Peter's mind. Here's how it plays out in verses 15 through 19. It says, when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said to him, you know that I love you. Feed my lambs, he told him. A second time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, he said to him, you know that I love you. Shepherd my sheep, he told him. He asked him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved that he asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Feed my sheep, Jesus said. Truly I tell you, when you were younger, you would tie your belt and walk wherever you wanted. But when you grow old, Peter, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will tie you and carry you where you do not want to go. He said this to indicate by what kind of death Peter would glorify God. After saying all this, Jesus told him, follow me. Jesus answers Peter's questions, even if he does it in a little more of a subtle and subversive way. See, firstly, he is checking Peter's heart. He wants to get a pulse on Peter's love for him. Because Jesus knows that the plans he has for Peter are big plans and they're difficult plans. And so he's saying, Peter, do you really love me? Because if you don't, you're going to fall and fail again. When the heat gets hot, you're going to run and deny me again, unless you love me more than anything else. And so he's testing Peter's heart here. And in doing so, he's showing him that, hey, there's, there's something up ahead still. Now, the second thing that you notice is that Jesus is communicating something to Peter, which you don't recognize at first, but he's telling Peter that Peter is completely restored and forgiven. Think about it. Let me ask you a question, and I would like you to respond. How many times did Peter deny Jesus? 
three. How many times did Jesus ask Peter, do you love me? Three. Three. Peter was grieved over it. Maybe he was grieved because he thought Jesus was, you know, kind of judging him a little bit or bringing up his failures. Maybe he just didn't catch on. But Jesus is doing that because he's saying, my ability to restore is still greater than your ability to wreck it. Yes, you denied me three times, but my restoration is so much greater. It can cover that and all of the other times in your life where you'll deny me, whether it's with words or with actions. And so he asked Peter this three times and then says that final phrase, follow me. Again, let's remember back years prior when this whole fish incident happened. That was the moment that Jesus asked Peter, follow me. And now it's years later and Peter has messed it up and Jesus is saying, hey, we've come full circle. I'm going to ask you again. Peter, follow me. And if you didn't catch Jesus' strange sounding riddle at the end of that passage, he's talking about Peter's impending death. See, church history tells us that Peter was also crucified. He was actually crucified upside down, is what the story says, because he didn't feel worthy to be crucified or to die in the same manner of Jesus, which is wild to think about, that the threefold denier turned into that bold of a martyr. That's another story for another time. But he's saying, follow me even to death, Peter. And if you love me truly, you will stand firm. He said, back then I asked you to cast the nets. I filled your boat. I asked you to follow me and I'm doing it again today because I have more souls for you to catch. He says, Peter, I'm not done with you. You may have thought that you completely blew it. You may have thought that this was dead and gone, but... I still have something for you. The story or the point that we see from Peter's life is that we can't so wreck our lives that Jesus can't restore us and use us still. We cannot so wreck it, so get off course that Jesus is left going, well, I don't know what to do now. I could have helped you if it was a little bit of a fumble, but now you really went and messed it up. Jesus can restore us despite anything that we have gone through, any mistakes that we have made, any failures that we have added up in our life. Maybe they were long ago. Maybe they were recent. Maybe you feel the sting of them from the past, or maybe you feel the weight of them from the present. And Jesus says, yes, it could be painful. Restoration is not always easy, but... That's what I do. I did it for Peter, who ruined it in his shining moment, and I can do it for anyone else. How do we know that? Well, when Jesus rose from the grave, he defeated enemies that were a lot bigger than your mistakes. He defeated death itself. Death was the inconquerable enemy. Everyone dies. Everyone goes up against this. No one can beat it. And yet Jesus said, no, I got that. I'm going to take care of that too. What about the ugliness of sin? The thing that held Jesus to the cross. The reason he had to go in the first place, Jesus said, yeah, I am going to destroy the power of that as well. And I will take the penalty of that so that you can be with God forever and the happiness and the joy of his presence forever so i defeated death i defeated sin and god defeated satan yes we still see satan at work in this world today we live in that in between we've talked about this before jesus has come he's done a lot of great things in forgiving us and dying for us but he's still going to come again And when he comes again, 
That's when he will restore all things and he will destroy all evil forever. But at this point, it's just a timer. It's just a countdown. It's going to happen. It's guaranteed. We just got to wait until we figure out when it happens. And so for you, if you know that in your life you need a restorer, if you know in your life that you need resurrection, if you know that you need a savior, then start there by trusting Jesus to save you from the power and the penalty of sin and then turn to him. And when he says, follow me, you follow him into whatever he calls you to. But you don't have to sit in your sin. You don't have to sit under the shadow of death. Because if you trust Jesus, he has defeated those things already. He went to the cross, and then when he rose again, it was his way of saying, everything I said was true. You can bank on it. You can count on it. When I said that I'm going to give you eternal life, when I rose again, check. I said that I was going to forgive your sins. When I rose again, check. Jesus has covered it all, and you can turn to him today. In fact, I'm going to ask everyone in here to bow your heads and close your eyes as we close today. And I want to give you that opportunity. If you have never trusted Jesus to save you from your sin, to be your Savior, to be your Lord who you follow and submit to in joy, if you have never done that, right where you are, no one's looking at you, just Right where you are, respond to him. Call out to him, maybe for the first time, and say, Jesus, I see my sin. I see my need for a Savior. Confess that to him. And say, Jesus, I want to follow you. I want to give you my life. And if that's you, and for today, for the first time, you made that decision... Again, no one's looking around at you. I want you to just slip up your hand. Slip up your hand in the air. If you said, today I trusted Jesus as my Savior, my Lord, for the first time. And if you feel comfortable, we would love to give you a Bible and a little gift. And so if you feel comfortable, keep your hand up in the air and we'll have someone give that to you just to get you started in the right direction. Let me pray for the rest of us. God, we thank you for your grace. God, we thank you that you completed the greatest sacrifice. God, and we thank you that you sealed the deal when you rose again. God, I pray that we would walk in resurrection power God, that we would walk in forgiveness because of what you've done. God, and I pray for those that trusted you for the first time. Lord, guide them. Guide them on the right steps moving forward. And we thank you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.